welcome, welcome everyone to this uh, new webinar uh, on uh, um, preventing and mitigating uh, land degradation. Uh, let me introduce myself. I'm Christina Petracchi and I head the FL eLearning Academy. So this uh, international technical webinar is one of a series of webinars that we organize together with Agrinium and with the United Nations Economic and Social Commission for Asia and Pacific. So this is a, um, a, a partnership that we have created to deliver these webinars. The thematic areas that are covered in the webinars um, are the ones related to the global challenges humanity has and needs to face, basically. And the thematic areas are also the ones covered in our FAO eLearning Academy courses, because as you know, we offer over 350 multilingual e-learning courses on various thematic areas, such as nutrition, sustainable food systems, water management, and also, of course, uh, land, land restoration, uh, and also um, uh, prevention and mitigation of land degradation, which is the thematic area uh, that we are going to cover in today's webinar. Today, we have the pleasure to have with us two uh, senior experts. Uh, the first one is a colleague of mine from FAO, Louis Bocquel, who is a policy officer. And um, the other one is Julien uh, Demenois, who is a senior scientist at SPIRAD. So we are very pleased to have them with us. And without further ado, I will give the floor to Louis Bocquel. Uh, Louis, the floor is yours. You have about 20 minutes. Thank you. Thank you. So I'm going to share my screen right now. Um, wait. Uh, okay. So we are going to to discuss on uh, three aspects um, of the subject. The first is on interrelation between the AFOLU sector um, and climate. Sorry, sorry, Luis, to interrupt you. We cannot see your screen. You cannot see my screen. Okay, now something is being shared. Okay, now you can click on your presentation. You see Very good. Screen? Yes, thanks. Okay, thank you. So uh, we have three parts which are going to be covered by this presentation. The first one is the interracial interrelation between the AFOLU sector and climate change. The second one in on, is on exact tool. I'm going to do just an introduction because uh, our time is limited. And the third part is on nutrient turnover strategies for mitigating land degradation. So first on interrelation, what we can say for the agriculture, clim uh, agriculture forestry and other land use is for sure it's threatened by climate change. It's responsible for one fourth of total greenhouse gas emission. And it has a huge potential to cost effectively mitigate. It's concerning three types of greenhouse gas, CO2, methane, and nitrous oxide. It's concerning both, uh, uh, mitigation is concerning both uh, the decrease of greenhouse gas source and the increase of uh, sinks. And uh, we have within the, agriculture, forestry, and overland use change. 70% of uh, agriculture mitigation potential, which is in developing countries. The three greenhouse gas uh, which are concerned uh, are quite, uh, uh, are covering the, the full uh, land use uh, and the full uh, forestry. You can see in this uh, picture, which is illustrating some ways uh, the complexity of uh, all these flows of uh, greenhouse gas. 
we see that we have uh, the methane coming from fire from uh, rice, aquatic rice from the soil, with, or from the, from the livestock. We can see also the nitrous oxide, which is coming here and there. What we can see also is that, uh, obviously, uh, with the solar energy, we have a main uh, carbon fixing uh, mechanism, which is transforming with the photosynthesis the CO2 from the air in, in a chain of uh, carbon within the biomass. We have uh, two main uh, stock uh, within the Afuru sector with all the biomass and all the soil carbon. So all these elements appear uh, on the picture somewhere. What uh, we can also say is that uh, we have uh, a vicious circle which is ongoing with the land degradation, which leads to carbon loss from the soil and which is speeding up the climate change and its impacts, which is increasing uh, the poverty of land users and weakens their ability to protect the land, which is again moving on uh, supporting, uh, causing worse uh, land degradation. And uh, this process is quite, uh, this process is quite advanced Currently, we have uh, the part of the forest land degraded at the planet level, which is about 50% of the forest area uh, to be added to the shrubland, which is also a degraded forest. So we have already on the planet 31.5 million square kilometer of a degraded forest. And uh, in terms of uh, farmland, we have about 33% of the world farmland, which is uh, moderately to highly degraded. And that is about 17 million square kilometers. So we have, through this very simple two data, we have the feeling that uh, we have uh, already a huge degree of uh, degradation of both uh, uh, forest and uh, farmland, which is on the same time constituting a, a huge potential for rehabilitation. The, this high level of degradation uh, is coming notably from negative impact of tillage-based agriculture practice. We can say that uh, intensive agriculture has contributed to the loss of about 30 to, uh, to 50% of soil organic in the last decade of uh, the 20th century. We can also, uh, we know also that uh, uh, loss of uh, soil organic is going with loss of water storage and uh, it's going with uh, emission of uh, CO2. Here an example is 3% of loss in soil organic for, for some soil is going with 432 uh, cubic meter of water storage loss per hectare and 400 ton of CO2 per hectare emitted. Such loss of soil organic carbon and water holding capacity is due to a range of practice that we, we know quite well now. It's about elimination of perennial ground cover, repetitive cultivation and tillage, continuous grazing, bare fallows, removal of uh, crop residues, or grass uh, land burning. Furthermore, intensive monoculture combining a high use of external input has been an approach where farmers have, uh, have, um, uh, have moved to a production of energy intensive, uh, I mean, it, it has required the production of energy intensive mineral fertilizer and pesticide. And these are major sources of uh, greenhouse gas emission. So somewhere we, we see that uh, we have a quite negative element here, but uh, there is a way to turn this uh, positively. Uh, we can look at uh, how, how do low carbon contribution, or how do low carbon auction contribute to agriculture productivity and food security? Here with uh, mitigation in agriculture with increased carbon in soil with decreased greenhouse gas emission, we can at the same time increase agriculture production and productivity with more biomass, more residue, more production, and better land management. And uh, that, that, that can drive to reduce also poverty and food, secu 
and improve food, se food security with additional value for farmers, community, society, and more employment. So that can uh, also some way support climate adaptation. So we see that uh, we have uh, potentially a series of uh, things which can be improved. We have reached a high level of degradation on land management, but we have a, a, a huge potential of rehabilitation. We have uh, this uh, 31 million square kilometer of degraded forest and 17 million uh, uh, of uh, farmland, which are making uh, about something like seven gigaton per year for the next 30 years in terms of, uh, of uh, a reduction of emission, which could be a equivalent of 14% uh, of total greenhouse gas emission. So now we are going to look at uh, slightly uh, what is exact tool. So exact tool is a, an Excel managed tool which has been developed by FAO. It's a partnership of three divisions in FAO, Investment Center, Policy Support Service, which is now no more existing, and, and ESA. And it was with an external partnership of ERD and a series of uh, donors, starting with World Bank, IFAD, and uh, IFD, which have uh, supported the development of this tool. Exact is the FAO tool to estimate the mitigation impact of agriculture and forestry projects, and it supports decision making for agriculture and forestry planning, policy, and investment projects. So, what is exactly exact? It's an Excel based tool to quantify the amount of greenhouse gas released or sequestered from activity in agricultural sector. It requires activity data on agricultural practices, resource use, and land use change. And it's calculating estimated greenhouse gas impact in ton of CO2 equivalent. The main logic of exact takes into account a series of uh, activity like deforestation, reforestation, other land use change, forest degradation, restoration of grassland, livestock cultivation of annual crops of perennials, uh, all what is about input and fertilization of crops, all what is energy used uh, in uh, farming and so on, and all what is installation of building and of irrigation system. And um, so looking at the uh, impact of uh, green, in terms of greenhouse uh, gas flux, in terms of emission and sink for CO2, methane, and, and nitrous oxide. And it's looking at the evolution of stock changes from and to different carbon pools, including above ground biomass, below ground biomass, soil, litter, and dead woods. So we are looking at both greenhouse gas emission, carbon stock change in carbon, and we move to a carbon balance in terms of equivalent CO2, if this carbon balance is positive, there is no, more emission, that is bad. If this carbon balance is negative, there is less emission, that is good, that is mitigation. So now let's go a bit inside the tool. What you see, up is a screen. Up in the screen is a menu of the tool. It's covering a description, land use change, crop production, grassland, management, degradation, coastal wetland, inputs, and fisheries. And uh, this exact tool is using the IPCC uh, coefficient. And it's using about 10,000 coefficient coming from International Panel of Climate Change. and uh, they are used as default coefficient. And uh, this coefficient, in order to select them for a specific uh, continent, for a specific climate, for a specific uh, soil type, we have to say to the tool where we are, what is the climate we have, what is the moisture regime we have, and what is the type of uh, 
soil on which we are, we are, we are for the project we are working on. We have also to specify the implementation phase, so the number of years of the project and the number of years of the capitalization phase, uh, because when we do the exact analysis, the carbon balance analysis, we should work on a recommended period of about 20 uh, years, which is adding uh, implementation phase and capitalization phase. Now, after having specified localization, soil and climate, we move to uh, the technical module of exact, which are eight major categories, web land use change, crop production and so on. In every module, we have sub module, like for land use change, we have deforestation, reforestation and other land use change. For crop production, we have annual crops, perennial crops, irrigated dries. For pasture and livestock, we have pasture, livestock, degradation, we have forest and organic soil and so on. Now, if we want to see how oh, it's organized in every uh, module, I just click here. And now we are in the crop production. And the first part of crop production is an annual system. Here, what you can see is two tables. One is for the land use change um, on annual crops, and the second one for annual crops who are staying annual crops. And what is the information we have in, we, are, we have to, to enter in terms of input, what does the practice, improved practice we're using in agriculture, uh, annual crops, and what are the number of hectares we, we, are, we have at start without project and with project. So that is the type of information we are entering. Now I am back to the global presentation of exact. As far as you have entered the information within the modules, uh, you have some results which are automatically calculated. And uh, these results are looking at uh, the growth and net balance in terms of uh, CO2 uh, uh, due to the project. If we look at this in, what we have is uh, we have uh, here what you can see is a uh, two colon, which one is a gross flux without. Uh, project and one is a gross uh, flux with project. And on the line, we have every uh, module which was described uh, before. And you see that you have a number here which is ton of CO2. So we have a result for every uh, situation without project, with project, and the balance which is making with project minus with, without project situation. And the result of the carbon balance analysis is appearing here, we have nine, minus 9.2 million ton of uh, CO2. So for this project of land rehabilitation in Africa, we are fixing 9.3 million ton of uh, CO2 on a period of uh, 20 years, which is specified here with 130,000 hectares. What is also specified in this uh, result table is where we are fixed, what, what are, where we, what, all this uh, result is balanced between the biomass, the soil, the other in terms of CO2 and, and uh, nitrous oxide and methane. So what we see here is that uh, the main result is car additional carbon in soil with about 5.3 million tons in 20 years and about 3.9 million tons of additional carbon in biomass. So that's what we, we can see from a very quick overview of the tool. What we should also understand is that we are working on two scenarios, the with and the without project scenario. And we, do, we are looking at uh, the incremental result. So the difference between with project and without project, which is the benefit of the project in terms of, uh, of uh, uh, mitigation. And, uh, in order to illustrate it, uh, I show you here the gross result without project and with project. We have uh, a result of 80,000 tons of emission without project, and we have a result of minus 20,000 tons uh, of uh, uh, emission without with project. And uh, the, 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 this result is coming with a 
for with, without project 100,000 ton of emission and minus 20,000 ton of uh, sequestration. Now, if we translate this in, term, in terms of uh, uh, a figure, what we see here is uh, the with project and uh, the without project, with, with project in the dark green and without project in the light green. So the emission are only 30 uh, with project and there are 100 uh, without project. And the sequestration is uh, only minus 20 with a project and minus 50 with project. So the total with project is minus 50 plus 30 minus 20. And the total without project is uh, 100 of emission and minus 20 of sequestration, so it's 80. And the difference between these two is the result. So what we do is with project minus without project is a balance. And the balance is translated here in a minus 100,000 tons of CO2, which is difference between minus 20,000 and 80,000. You see? No. Uh, that was a very, very quick uh, introduction, but we have a four to five hours of uh, e-learning uh, in English, in French, and in Spanish with exercise and so on, which is available on the FO e-learning. And uh, that has been developed with the support of uh, World Bank. And it's available for you, it's free, you can use it as you, as you want. Thank you. Thank you very much, We oui. So there oui. are of um there are a number of questions for you so i invite sorry, you I didn't finish yet <laughs> oh, sorry sorry <laughs> ah, so let, let me finish uh, i have supposed to have 25 minutes so now uh, we have a series of studies which are available also on the web of exact i don't go into detail on this uh, my third part is on nutrient uh, turnover strategy for mitigating land degradation what we have come what has come out is that from what we have seen is that one of the most promising ways to mitigate climate change is through agriculture and landscape climate solution. And uh, we have uh, a huge potential of ter terrestrial uh, carbon sequestration with uh, photosynthesis. And we have uh, a series of uh, possibilities with wide scale afforestation and expansion of agroforestry value chain, which are key strategy for inversing degradation process. One of uh, the examples could be the Sahel uh, Green Barrier, which is really uh, uh, a series of opportunity for, for re uh, reforesting a, a big part of uh, the Sahel uh, while doing support to some value chain. And uh, among this value chain, we have uh, analyzed the, the share value chain potential for between 2020 and 2030 in terms of uh, mitigation. And it's quite huge. And we are currently analyzing also the gamma Arabic value chain at regional level. These two value chain being associated, being beneficiary of uh, the green barrier efforts to, to replant acacia trees and other trees. Another example is uh, the rehabilitation of the cocoa value chain in Ghana and Ivory Coast uh, with a huge plan, uh, with very ambitious planning uh, on between 2020 and 2030. And here we have uh, analyzed for the both country, uh, what could be uh, the potential uh, of mitigation of uh, this uh, strategy, which are very costly in fact. And we are having about 17 million tons of CO2 fixed per year. If we combine above as a, the strategy of Ivory Coast and the strategy of, uh, of uh, Ghana. Just for Ghana, it's about $900 million, which are going to be invested in the coming years. So all this to say that um, we have a, a series of, uh, of solutions for, with sustainable practice, with co-benefit for adaptation and mitigation. And uh, another example could be also uh, a recent work derived from uh, 10 years for agroecology in Europe, TIFA, which demonstrates that uh, 
scenario towards 2050 in Europe based on agroecology and land sharing approach could significantly uh, uh, mitigate with a transformation scenario which could fix up to 33% of uh, current uh, greenhouse gas emission for France. At European level, the similar scenario could fix up to 735 million tons of CO2 per year, which is 16% of uh, annual emission of uh, uh, Europe 28. So that is just to show you that uh, the, the potential of uh, Afulu sector is huge. And to finish, we have a series of uh, examples outside this, like uh, Morocco, which has uh, developed also its own uh, climate uh, green wall uh, strategy, transforming landscape. And we have uh, a series of other things. Uh, I'm going to stop here because I'm being said to be short. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. So while uh, uh, while I will give the floor to, to Julia, please, uh, please, Louis, look at the, the, the question and answers because there have been many questions for you. Uh, and after uh, Julien, I will give you the floor again to answer uh, some of the questions. So Julien, the floor is yours. You have about 20 minutes. Thank you very much. Thank you, Christina. And good morning, good afternoon, and good evening for everyone, wherever you are. First, I will share my screen. OK, I hope you can see my screen right now. So it's a pleasure and an honor to participate to this important webinar, and I would like to thank the organizers for their invitation. I would like this afternoon to talk about uh, agricultural and forestry strategies to prevent and mitigate soil degradation, with a special focus on nutrient turnover and carbon sequestration. My talk will be divided in three parts. The first one will be probably a reminder for most of you, as I will uh, try to address three questions. What is land degradation? What is the extent of land degradation and what are the challenges? My second part will be focused on potential strategies in agriculture and forestry to prevent and mitigate land degradation. And in my third part, I would like to share with you an example of agroforestry project based on nitrogen fixing trees in Democratic Republic of Congo to produce sustainable charcoal and cassava and simultaneously improve nutrient turnover and carbon sequestration. So first of all, what is land degradation? Just some uh, definitions coming from the IPBS. So land degradation refers to the many processes that drive the decline or loss in biodiversity, ecosystem function of services and it concerns all terrestrial ecosystems. So I would like to highlight some of the, of the words in this definition. So first, biodiversity. I'm sure everybody knows what is biodiversity, but we can summarize it as a diversity within species, between species and of and ecosystems. So if there is a decline or a loss, there is a land degradation. About the ecosystem functions, here today, so this is, a, it concerns the flow of energy and materials. And uh, for our topic today, it includes particularly the biomass production and the nutrient cycling. And about the ecosystem services. So ecosystem services are focused on the services for people like us. And it has been defined as a Millennium Ecosystem Assessment in four categories, supporting, regulating, provisioning, and cultural. And you can see here on this slide that nutrient cycling is part of the supporting ecosystem services as, and climate regulation is part of the regulating ecosystem services. So those two topics, nutrient cycling and climate regulations are the focus of our webinar today. So now let's have a look at the extent of land degradation and uh, at the challenges related to land degradation. So again, the IPBS in its uh, report uh, related to land degradation restoration said that this is a pervasive and systemic phenomenon that occurs in all parts of the terrestrial world. And if we have a look at this map, which is, I admit, 
quite difficult, in fact, to understand, but I will try to, to simplify it. We have some hotspot, let's say, of deforestation, which is a, a kind of land degradation. We have also dryland degradation, which uh, are in light brown on this map. And we have also decreasing soil health, for instance, which is in gray on this map. So now let's have a, a more closer look at some of those drivers of uh, degradation. First about forest degradation and deforestation. We have to, to, to keep in mind that the rate of deforestation since 2001 is about 5 million hectares per year, which is of course a high rate. And in terms of impact of, uh, on, uh, on, on climate, uh, this, involves, this implies in fact a release of about 1.5 gigaton of carbon each year, according to the global carbon budget. That is about 14% four, uh, of the CO2, uh, global CO2 emissions. On this map, again, we saw different uh, drivers of the deforestation. In red, we have uh, deforestation related to the production of commodity, like oil palm here in, uh, in Southeast Asia, for instance, soybean here in, uh, in uh, South America, shifting agriculture in yellow, mainly in... Uh, in, in, in Africa, for instance, and also some other um, sources of, uh, of, of GIG emission and forest degradation, like wildfire or urbanization. Concerning the soil health degradation, a, a way, let's say, or kind of proxy of the, of the soil health is uh, the, the content of soil organic carbon. And as uh, Louis said just before, there have been many assessments, and especially in this report of the IPBS, uh, they assess that since the, during the two last centuries, about 8% of the soil organic carbon stocks um, were, were, were lost. In fact, on this map, this is all the, the areas which appeared in, uh, in brown or, or red. Uh, this is a comparison between the situation two centuries ago and the situation in 2010. In terms of uh, GHG emission, uh, the, this is the equivalent of 176 gigaton of carbon, which were released during those two centuries in the atmosphere. And in fact, according to the expert of the IPBS, about one third of the soils globally are moderately to highly degraded. One thing I would like to emphasize or to, to put the focus today is the close relationship between the soil organic carbon, nitrogen, and phosphorus. There are close linkages. First of all, we have to keep in mind that carbon is the main component of the soil organic matter. It's about 60% of the soil organic matter. And the carbon is strongly coupled to nutrients such as nitrogen and phosphorus. Indeed, in a wide range of global soils, there are constant ratio between nitrogen and carbon and between phosphorus and carbon. That means that if we want to increase the soil organic stock in the soils, the availability of nutrients and in particular of uh, nitrogen and phosphorus is a key issue. On this map, which is coming from a, a very recent publication by uh, Du et al, we have the nitrogen and phosphorus limitation of terrestrial carbon uptake, which means that in, if there is not enough uh, nitrogen or not enough phosphorus, this is a limitation to sequester carbon on, in, in the terrestrial ecosystems. In red, you have the areas mainly in boreal uh, region and also in, a, in, in the Tibet plateau, where the nitrogen is a limiting factor and the author says that it's about 18% of the natural, natural terrestrial land area, which is concerned by this limitation by nitrogen. And in blue, you have the areas where the availability of phosphorus is a limitation to the terrestrial carbon uptake. And this, uh, for phosphorus, the concern is much larger, I would say, because the author says that this is about 43% of the natural terrestrial land area that is concerned by limited availability by phosphorus. So there is a, a huge phosphorus challenges if we want to 
sequester more carbon on the terrestrial ecosystem and especially in agriculture and forestry. However, the situation is quite different, let's say from region to, to region. And here I show you a map from Europe uh, concerning the availability of nitrogen in the soil. And in fact, what we see that first of all, that there is quite high diversity of nitrogen content in the soil from a high level in green to low level in, in brown. And in fact, the challenge in, uh, in Europe, or at least in some part of Europe, is a little bit different than in, in other parts of the world, I would say. We have a concern with nitrogen leaching and eutrophication of aquatic ecosystem. Saying so that, in fact, we, in some areas, we have too much nitrogen in the soil. So it's a contrasting situation compared to what I've said just before with the global uh, map with the nitrogen limitation. So let's go back to the, to the IPBS and also the IPCC report, uh, the special report on land uh, to, to conclude on the extent of land degradation and the challenges. According to uh, the two reports, uh, they say that the well-being of at least 3.2 billion people are negatively today impacted by land degradation. So this is uh, uh, about uh, one third of the, two, uh, of the total population, more or less. And this land degradation as a cost for the economy, which is uh, assessed to be about 10% of the annual global gross product. And in fact, this land degradation is uh, exacerbated by the impact of climate change. As we can see on this, uh, on this figure coming from the IPCC report from uh, the special report on, on, on land, uh, on, on this figure you have different uh, phenomenon related to land degradation, soil erosion here, vegetation loss, wildlife damage, wildfire damage, sorry, and permafrost degradation. And the intensity of the impact of uh, um, an increase of the temperature, uh, the more uh, the color is red to purple, the higher the impact is. And you can easily see that the impact is already here because we are here with a one degree increase uh, right now. And the projection, the future projection are between three and four degrees in uh, 2100. So you can easily see that the impact uh, of climate change on land degradation uh, are expected to be, to be high, especially of course on the permafrost degradation, which is already a reality, but also on some phenomenon like soil erosion, for instance. And if I come back to the phosphorus issue, which uh, I've mentioned just before, uh, this issue of a uh, water erosion exacerbated by climate change would in fact as well exacerbate the uh, issue of uh, phosphorus uh, uh, need and, and, and losses. Here is a map coming from, uh, again, a recent publication. And they assess on this map in this publication that uh, about more than 50%, in fact, of the total phosphorus losses today are due to the water erosion. And uh, those areas uh, where this um, loss of, uh, of, of phosphorus uh, due to water erosion is high uh, are in blue here on this map. So those area in Southeast Asia, here in Northeast Africa, for instance, and some areas here in, uh, in, uh, in, in South America. So there is a real issue with phosphorus. So now let's have a look at the solutions uh, to, to, um, to, to prevent these uh, nutrient losses and, uh, and uh, have a positive impact on the carbon sequestration and adaptation to, to climate change. So this uh, figure is coming from the IPCC report, special report on land, and they assess several options based on the land management and the impact of those several options on several factors or several phenomena, mitigation and adaptation to climate change, desertification, land degradation, food security, and also the cost of implementation of those different solutions. Uh, all the, sol what, oh, the, all the solution with the blue means that it has a positive impact. And when it is red, it has a negative impact. 
the darker the blue is, the higher the impact, the positive impact is. And we can see that there are some options which have only positive impacts on mitigation, adaptation to climate change, desertification, land degradation, and food security. And one of those options is the increase of soil organic carbon content, which is uh, in, in dark blue and which is considered to have a moderate cost of implementation. So now I would like to, uh, to make a focus on, the, on this increase of soil organic carbon and uh, see how is it possible to increase the soil organic carbon. So I would like to, to remind that this is uh, the core purpose of the 4 per thousand initiative, which was uh, launched during COP21 in, uh, in, um, in 2015 in, in Paris. And uh, in fact, there are, let's say, two ways to increase the soil organic carbon. One way is to increase the carbon inputs in soils. And there are several strategies and management options which already exist. Agroforestry is one of it. Integrated management of soil fertility. Pasture management and grazing lands. The use of organic fertilizers, especially in uh, substitution to uh, mineral fertilizers or in association with mineral fertilizers. Water management, conservation agriculture, which is the application of three principles, a permanent cover, crop rotation, and a limited disturbance of soil or no-till. And last example is uh, the implementation of principles of agroecology. And the second option, and the two could be combined, of course, increase of carbon inputs and the decrease of carbon outputs, uh, could be in some um, situation, um, a better fire management, to limit the, uh, the mineralization of, uh, of biomass of, in carbon, the control of erosion, and also the minimum disturbance of soil and especially through uh, no TH. Now I would like through one example, which will be my last part of my presentation to have a focus on the agroforestry. So let's move to uh, the Congo Basin and especially in the Democratic Republic of Congo. So we are here. Uh, this project, the example I, I would like to share with you uh, is called the Mampu Project. It's about 200 kilometers from, from uh, Kinshasa City. And this is a, a large project of agroforestry with about 8,000 hectares of agroforestry with, uh, the the, with uh, Acacia auriculiformis, which is a uh, nitrogen fixing trees which were planted between 1978 and 1992. And the type of agroforestry system is what we call the rotational woodlot system. I will come back on this. On this uh, picture, uh, which is a remote sensing picture, you have the perimeter of the project, which, uh, which are the 8,000 hectares, which are divided in a woodlot of about 25 hectares per family. So this is a picture of the of the area, the plateau Bateke. We we have uh, we are at an altitude of about 700 meters high, an annual rainfall of 1,500 millimeter. Uh, feralic arenosol, with a, which are sandy, acidic, and uh, chemically very poor. And the natural vegetation is a gramineous savanna with a low tree density, as you can see on this picture. This savanna is periodically burned to support hunting practices in particular. And uh, shifting cultivation is traditionally uh, practiced in gallery forest. And uh, since the introduction of tractors, mechanized farming occurred in, uh, in savanna. And it looks like this, for instance, with a cassava production on large scale uh, farms, for instance, on the Bateke Plateau. And also since the 90s, uh, sorry, since the 70s, uh, there were uh, afforestation of some part of the savanna with uh, nitrogen fixing trees in particular to supply Kinshasa with charcoal. So let's go back to the Mampu project and the agroforestry system, which is implemented for now several decades. So this is a rotational woodlot system, which means that we have an alternate phase of food crop production with a phase of fallow planted with nitrogen fixing trees. So it looks like this. You have the crop production between uh, during the, let's say, the, the two first years of the, of the plantation. 
at the same time the tree are planted. And then for, in this example, 11 years, we have a first fallow with acacia. The acacia are harvested uh, and uh, there is a production of charcoal on site. And then again, we have the crop production on the same plot. The seed from the acacia uh, germinated, especially thanks to the burning. And again, we have a second fallow with acacia and it can continue like this for uh, a third rotation. So on this picture, you have uh, the beginning of the, of the crop production, for instance, with cassava. Uh, it's important to keep in mind that the slash residues like leaves, branches, bark, they are left on site. And uh, there is also an application of the ashes of the charcoal production. This is a fallow uh, with the trees, with the nitrogen fixing trees, Acacia auriculiformis. And here you have, after the harvesting of the Acacia auriculiformis, the production of the charcoal on site. So let's have a look now to uh, the impact, let's say, of this uh, kind of uh, agroforestry system with N fixing, uh, nitrogen fixing trees. Here, a focus on the above ground biomass and uh, the, the carbon sequestration in, uh, thanks to the trees. So in this table, we have several uh, modalities. The afforestation, second fallow uh, nitrogen fixing uh, trees, and a third fallow. And in this column of the table, we have the above ground biomass, AGB which is more or less, let's say, the stock of carbon in the, uh, which, is a which was sequestered in the, uh, in the above ground biomass of the trees. The below ground biomass, which also account for uh, an important part of the potential of carbon sequestration is not presented here in this table. But what we can see in this table, not surprisingly, is that the, um, above, um, the above ground biomass uh, is pretty uh, high, especially if we would compare this with, uh, with the stock in the, in the natural savanna. And the stock is increasing with the age of the, of the trees and with the duration of the fallow, which is not really a surprise. The second uh, effect or impact of the nitrogen fixing trees uh, is on the soil. So now let's have a look at the soil analysis for the zero to 20 centimeter depths. Here you have the results from soil analysis for the savanna, the originally savanna, with a pH, carbon, nitrogen content, and phosphorus content. And here you have the results for the different modalities of the agroforestry system. We have the same colors like uh, just before, afforestation only in green, uh, second fallow in black, and in blue, the third fallow. And what we have to, to keep in mind is that for the carbon content, uh, we have a significant higher content of carbon for all the agroforestry modalities compared to the savanna, which is a control. You can see here in this column, the, we have the same result in fight from, for the nitrogen. And for the phosphorus, the, there is no significant difference in the content of phosphorus in soil between the savanna and between the agroforestry system and the different modalities of the agroforestry systems. So what was the effect of the rotational woodlot in Mampu? An increase in carbon sequestration in the above ground biomass, an increase in the carbon and nitrogen content in soil, no effect on phosphorus in soil, but no depletion, it's important to, to notice this. But we have several negative impacts, a decrease in the pH, as you can see here, and also a decrease in other soil nutrients, which is my next slide. Here we have the same different modalities with the savanna, afforestation, second fallow and third fallow, and several nutrients, nutrients which were measured, calcium, magnesium, potassium, and aluminum. And what we saw is that due to the uh, implementation of the afforestation uh, of the agroforestry system, sorry, we have a decrease in the content of calcium, a decrease also in the content of magnesium and also in potassium. And on the reverse, an increase in the content of aluminum in the soil. 
which is of course an issue in terms of sustainability uh, of the system and uh, in terms of sustainability from uh, nutrient uptake for the agroforestry and the crop production. Those results are coming from a publication from uh, some of my colleagues at CIRAD, and this one, Dubiez et al. And they made some uh, several recommendations, in fact, to limit those negative impact of the uh, implementation of this uh, agroforestry system, which are summarized here. The first one is to debark the trees on site before the carbonization to increase the inputs of calcium in the soil, to return also part of the charcoal to the soil so that it will have a, a positive impact on the pH, which will increase, and as a consequence, which will decrease also the saturation of aluminum, which is an issue because it will limit the uptake of other nutrients, to also increase the restitution of leaves, twigs, small branches to the soil, to increase the, the coming back of, of, of nutrients, and finally, to uh, have limestone amendments also to increase the pH and uh, enhance the exchangeable calcium. Just to conclude, I would like to um, enlarge this example of uh, agroforestry with uh, just a figure coming from a, a, a meta-analysis, a paper from uh, also one of my uh, colleagues, uh, which was uh, done to, to, to revise some of the IPCC coefficient, which were mentioned by Louis just before. Uh, and they assess the impact of agroforestry systems worldwide on the soil organic uh, carbon stocks. And in this figure, we have three kinds of, um, of, uh, of, of situation. The first one is a conversion of cropland to agroforestry system here in yellow. In brown, you have the conversion of forest to agroforestry system. And in green, you have the conversion of grassland to agroforestry system. And what they found and what they, what they showed is that uh, the conversion of cropland to agroforestry system or to, of grassland to agroforestry system has a positive impact on the carbon sequestration in the soil, which is not the case for the conversion of forest to agroforestry system. Just to finish, if you want to know more about this uh, subject of uh, relationship between soil and climate and climate change, I invite you to stay tuned to this uh, uh, to this web page, because in uh, in the coming um, in the coming months, especially in uh, during the second quarter of 2021, uh, there will be a massive open online course which will be launched on the fun platform with uh, Agrinium and Cirad in particular. So I invite you to stay tuned if you want to to know more about this uh, topic. And also here are the list of uh, the references I've used and uh, mentioned during my presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you very much. Uh, this was actually very, very clear and comprehensive. Thank you, um, Julien. Uh, I would like to uh, uh, inform all of you also that we are also planning to, uh, to uh, deliver a MOOC in, uh, by, uh, by the end of the year on, on um, forestry transparent data under the Paris Agreement. So that also could be of interest. I am, uh, we are here showing, thanks to Fabio, uh, the list of FAO e-learning courses that might be of interest to you, which are related to EXACT, but also others related to uh, the transparency framework, others related to uh, national greenhouse uh, gas inventories. So how do the countries prepare the inventories, how to make the calculations, but also we have courses on climate smart soil and land management, uh, water management also and climate smart agriculture and also sustainable land management and land restoration. So uh, have a look at the FAO eLearning Academy offerings. And um, I would like now to give the floor to Louis uh, yeah. to answer to some of the questions. Uh, also note that uh, we will be preparing a document with all your questions and the answers of the experts, and this will all be made available uh, through the um, FAO eLearning uh, Academy section on webinars, where you can have access to the recordings, to the materials, and also to the answers um, of the questions you have been posing um, 
during the webinar. So, Luis, the floor is yours to answer some of the questions. Uh, Thank you. Julien, please have a look at the questions that were asked during your presentations, uh, your present because you will be asked to uh, to provide some of the answers. Uh, Louis, the floor is yeah. yours. So one of the questions was, can the exact tool be used to measure the progress towards country and DC? If so, how do you determine the without project uh, scenario? And. Uh, yeah, I can say that uh, we are already using uh, exact tool for NDC analysis and for NDC monitoring, and we are currently organizing training for NDC uh, team with the support of uh, the Division of Climate and the Biodiversity in FAO. And on the other part of the question, how do we determine the without project scenario? Uh, in exact, uh, the without project scenario is an issue because uh, it's a sort of uh, assumption on the future. What, what is going to happen if we don't do anything? Uh, usually we are looking at three options. Either we have a constant uh, situation or we have, uh, we're, based, we're basing uh, the, uh, the without project scenario on the past trends. For instance, uh, if we had deforestation for 5,000 hectares per year in the last uh, 20 years, we can see that the same is going to occur in the without project scenario. And the third option is to, to look at uh, uh, future, future options which could occur. And uh, that is more difficult, but uh, if we know that uh, something uh, is going to happen in the country, or if we know that uh, we have some uh, big investment for which will, which will consume a lot of uh, land and so on, uh, it can be possible to have a future a future scenario with based on this. Now the other question, uh, which was uh, coming out, is about uh, uh, it's about uh, the the way we have managed the agroforestry uh, model, uh, and uh, the agroforestry model has been recently updated thanks to the support of. Uh, of CIRAD and uh, we have had reached it and uh, that has been done with uh, uh, a research work done by uh, CIRAD and uh, which uh, allowed to update the IPCC uh, database on agroforestry which was the, the let's say the, the weakest part of IPCC work. Now there was another thing on uh, Carbon sequestration in the biomass. Uh, uh, some way, uh, there is a question linked with uh, what is going to happen if we are making charcoal and how do we, do, do we uh, measure this? Uh, we have some assumptions which have been used in exact to transform charcoal in equivalent uh, uh, biomass and in equivalent hectare. Uh, so to translate uh, a certain level of uh, charcoal consumption in an equivalent of um, deforested area. Now we had also something else, which was uh, on, uh, uh, wait, wait, uh, I think, I think that's it for the while. Uh, Julien, I don't know if you have had the opportunity to have a look at the questions and if you're ready to provide some of the answers, that would be good. Yeah, thank you, Christina. Yeah, I had a look at the different questions. Uh, maybe I can follow up with, uh, with the last point, which was uh, mentioned by, by Louis about the carbon sequestration and the charcoal production. Um, because I, I think also it was linked to, uh, to the presentation I made and the example I've given in the in the Air Congo. Um, in, in this particular example, it's uh, indeed uh, very important to keep in mind that without this kind of project, uh, usually the, the, the char charcoal is produced from, uh, the, from the deforestation. So it's, uh, uh, that means that it, um, uh, it leads to uh, direct GAG emission because of an unsustainable production of, of, of charcoal and unsustainable production of, uh, of, of the biomass resource. So the, this kind of project uh, is, um, in terms of uh, charcoal production, the, the effect is, uh, 
um, is in fact neutral because the, the biomass is, uh, is produced sustain sustainably. And uh, so the balance between the emission due to the production of the charcoal and the sequestration linked to the, to the, to the biomass growth are supposed to, uh, to compensate each other. Um, but it's really important to, to, to have in mind is that if we want to, um, to, uh, to assess the, the real impact we, we need to make the balance between the emissions and the sequestration as it is done in the, in the exact uh, tool, for instance. Um, the, in this question, there is also a, a question about the, uh, the evolution of the, of the soil bulk densities. Uh, it's also important to, to keep in mind that uh, uh, if we want to assess the, uh, the, the soil carbon stocks, we need several uh, data. We need to have information about um, the soil organic content, but we need also to have the bulk density to convert this into a stock. Uh, in the example which uh, I have given, and in this particular publication, the authors did not mention uh, any information about the um, evolution of the bulk density. So I cannot answer uh, this, uh, this question. I don't know uh, how the bulk density evolved. So that means that in this particular uh, example of the Mampu project, maybe finally the carbon stocks in the soils, maybe they decrease or maybe they were equivalent or maybe they increase compared to the control, which is a 7 up. But today I cannot give you the answer because I don't have the information about the bulk density. Uh, I've selected this, uh, however, this example, especially to show you the linkages between the carbon content, the nitrogen, the phosphorus, and the other nutrients. Uh, but this is also why I've um, uh, chosen to, to, to present you this, uh, my last figure with a box plot and uh, coming from the, from the meta-analysis uh, to show you that globally speaking, there are quite good confidence about the impact of uh, agroforestry system on the soil organic carbon uh, stocks. So in, in, in the project of Mampu, right now I don't have the information, but globally speaking, we know that uh, we know what are the, the, the impact in terms of evolution of soil organic carbon stocks due to agroforestry. Uh, I saw also that, and maybe I can give a, a, an answer, that there was a technical question about the methods of uh, measuring uh, carbon sequestration or let's say carbon in, 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 in the soil. Uh, what is usually recommended is to use a dry combustion uh, method in, in laboratory to, uh, to measure the, the total carbon of the soil uh, and to, to measure the inorganic carbon, which is part of the question. Usually, usually we, you had some um, acid to, um, to measure the inorganic carbon. And uh, if you... Um, uh, with, a, with a total carbon minus the inorganic carbon, you have the organic carbon. This is uh, basically the, the way to measure. Uh, and again, I repeat, one important thing is to have the, the, the carbon content. But if you want to measure the carbon sequestration, so an evolution in the carbon stocks, you will need to have to measure also the, um, uh, the bulk density and also to, to, to measure or to to note the soil depths uh, and the soil layer for which your measurements are available. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Julien, for, for these answers. And uh, to the participants, I wanted to mention that uh, the answers of all the questions will be provided as a document uh, in the SL uh, eLearning Academy. Uh, webinar section. So there you will be able to, to have access to all, uh, all the materials, not only of this webinar, but all the previous webinars of uh, 2020. Uh, I would like to take this opportunity to thank, first of all, the speakers, 
thank you very much for the excellent and very comprehensive presentations. I would like to thank our partners, Agrinium and UNSCAP, um, uh, all, all the, the, uh, my team members who are behind the scenes, Fabio Picinic and also Aristide Bucare, and of course, all of you, the participants. Thank you very much for being part of the success of these webinars. Thank you all and stay tuned. There are many more also for 2021 and, and also for in November and December. Thank you very much. Bye-bye.